Thank you very much. Uh, what I want to do is try to stuff uh, 30 years of experience into 25 minutes. And so I won't be going into a lot of detail, but I think uh, I can get the, the important messages across. So this is the uh, culprit. And among the uh, serial aphids, it's quite easy to identify. It has, uh, the cornicles are greatly reduced, barely visible uh, without a microscope. And then at the rear, it has a, what we call a supracaudal projection. So there are two uh, apparent cauda at the end. Uh, in terms of history, uh, this is a native to the Transcaucasus region, which are the mountains that run up through Central Asia, and it's found on either side of those mountains. The uh, first report of this aphid was uh, of a, an outbreak on wheat in Russia in the early 1900s. That's where it gets its name. But in the uh, 50s and 60s, it started to expand somewhat uh, in global terms. And uh, its first uh, sort of major stop was South Africa in the 70s. South Africa continues to have problems with this aphid in its lower rainfall areas. Uh, then it uh, showed up in Mexico in 1978 and quickly moved from Central America, Mexico up into uh, the southern Great Plains of the United States in a, just a matter of a few years. Then it uh, uh, was also detected in the southern cone of uh, South America, and all this time it was expanding its range in Europe and uh, Africa. Uh, in Eastern Africa, it's now considered to be the number one insect problem on wheat in that region. And it uh, sort of completed its uh, global expansion here in Australia in uh, 2016. This is the last major wheat producing region of the world that had not been invaded. So it was not unexpected. This is what uh, severe Russian wheat aphid damage looks like. You'll see uh, large uh, circular areas in a field. Uh, we know several things about these areas now. One is that this would have required uh, infestation in the fall. This is uh, early spring. Uh, and secondly, we know that if you wait this long to treat uh, aphids, you've waited too long. This is well past the economic injury level uh, stage. If you look within these uh, circles, you will find uh, stunted and discolored plants. And these plants are characterized by having tightly rolled leaves. And uh, this, uh, the leaf rolling is a key part of Russian wheat aphid biology. They actually uh, prevent the leaf from unrolling, which uh, provides some sort of a tube-like habitat in which they live. And that uh, rolled leaf protects them from natural enemies to some degree, from uh, intense precipitation, and also from uh, insecticides. So it, uh, it's a, quite an important part of their success. If you look within one of these rolled uh, leaves, uh, you'll find uh, several things. One is these uh, longitudinal white streaks. That's characteristic uh, damage on any grass uh, that uh, will host a Russian wheat aphid. In wheat, we also see this characteristic uh, purplish or pinkish discoloration, and more so at lower temperatures. Uh, in this picture, you see the two main morphological forms of the aphid, uh, the winged form in the center, which is primarily for dispersal, uh, and dispersal can mean either very locally from plant to plant or uh, longer distance from field to field or even over a number of miles. Uh, and then the uh, wingless females are uh, primarily uh, for reproduction and, uh, and feeding. Those are their, the main parts of their lifestyle. And I might point out that uh, this aphid, is, uh, as uh, other aphids do, uh, have what are called telescoping generations. And by that I mean that uh, when uh, these aphids are born, they contain embryos. In other words, they're pregnant, and those embryos contain embryos. So each individual 
represents three generations, which has a number of implications for uh, uh, fecundity. Uh, Colorado has experienced sort of a disproportionate share of the uh, aphid problem. And over the next few slides, I want to try to explain why that is. Uh, but uh, over the years, we've treated uh, well over 2 million hectares of uh, wheat for this problem. This represents about 30% of the total in the United States, while we only grow about 5% of the uh, of the wheat, so it is a disproportionate problem for us. And that, uh, uh, that has resulted in uh, economic losses of approximately $200 million uh, in terms of uh, reduced yields and increased uh, production costs. And most of those losses were incurred during the 15, first 15 years of the uh, invasion. So, uh, talking a little bit more about uh, year-round success of the aphid. Uh, this is uh, a graph that depicts uh, sort of the year-round uh, cycle of the aphid in the uh, Great Plains from, uh, this would be roughly Texas, and this would be roughly the Dakotas and the Prairie Provinces. So, uh, to be successful, what this aphid needs to do is to get from winter wheat crop one to uh, winter wheat crop two. In the southern plains, this is primarily accomplished by uh, infesting volunteer wheat, or your, uh, you refer to it as a green bridge. And that, uh, that's the only way for the aphid to get from wheat crop one to wheat crop two, uh, is on volunteer wheat. So that makes uh, volunteer wheat management, green bridge management, uh, a key aspect of Russian wheat aphid management in the southern plains. And there are many more reasons for controlling volunteer apart from uh, Russian wheat aphid, but uh, it is a key element in that uh, part of the uh, wheat of this wheat production area. However, as you go north, uh, the season of the uh, growing season of the cool season grasses, and there are a variety of species, uh, extends and overlaps both the uh, uh, previous winter wheat crop and the uh, coming winter wheat crop. So uh, in the central plains and north, the uh, cool season grasses are sufficient to get the aphids from crop one to crop two. We spent uh, quite some time uh, surveying uh, cool season grasses. And there are a number of uh, species that are uh, capable of carrying the aphid uh, through the summer, which is a critical point in their sort of their annual uh, cycle. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure which of these are grown here or which of these will be important here, but for us, this is a key aspect of uh, Russian wheat aphid field biology. And I might point out that uh, in Colorado, those uh, grasses grow up to the continental divide and the aphid will follow them up. So we found aphids as high as uh, 10,000 feet in elevation feeding on these cool season grasses. So uh, if you look at the uh, Great Plains, uh, you can look at uh, aphid success primarily in terms of two components from uh, suitability from uh, south to north uh, is explained by uh, milder overwintering temperatures and from uh, north to south by the availability of these cool season grasses. And when you combine those uh, two factors, you'll find that uh, really southeastern Colorado is the area of greatest Russian wheat aphid year-round success. Uh, the one uh, consideration that this uh, depiction doesn't include is that of uh, biological control, which I'll uh, emphasize in, in a couple of minutes. But I wanted to uh, just try to characterize a little bit this, this uh, successful environment. So uh, average temperatures in this area, uh, 
can go up into the uh, mid-30s, and I'm now well aware that the temperatures in Australia can go well above that. Uh, my, in my stay in Loxton, we hit 46. So that's one thing I'm looking forward to getting away from. And then the lower temperatures uh, go down into the negative teens. And I will point out that this is a remarkably cold-tolerant aphid. Uh, uh, we've measured supercooling points in this aphid, and they're roughly minus 25. And it can uh, go uh, get, have prolonged exposure to minus 10 and uh, without too many negative effects. At minus 10, you start to see uh, reductions in fecundity after prolonged exposure. Uh, then uh, precipitation. Uh, Colorado wheat is produced uh, f across a gradient from about 250 millimeters of uh, precipitation to about 500. And I will say that uh, the eastern limit of the distribution of this aphid is probably uh, related to total rainfall. We've really never seen it much beyond that uh, 500 millimeter uh, line, which is, runs sort of through uh, central Kansas. So we have uh, monitored uh, Russian wheat aphid flights over the years. And uh, I'll make a couple of comments here. These are uh, total suction trap captures uh, graphed uh, annually for two locations. And uh, these, uh, the abundance peaks that you see here are uh, quite well related really to uh, economic activity. Uh, so this first peak was the year that we sprayed approximately 40% of the acres in uh, Colorado. And uh, this is the last outbreak that we've had. So looking uh, sort of long term at our experience, we had roughly 15 years of pretty significant economic activity. And since then, the aphid has sort of settled down and become... Uh, much more just a member of our background pest complex and over the last several years has been really just a sporadic problem for us. And I uh, would not surprise me to see that same pattern here. Uh, you know, several years of rapid expansion followed by uh, coalescing back into more prone areas and finally uh, becoming just another uh, member of the uh, pest complex. We have a look some at biological control with an emphasis on generalist predators. And uh, the only comment that I'll <clears throat> excuse me, make here is that uh, all of the uh, natural enemy species that we've encountered in our biological control studies have been the usual suspects. These are the species that we would expect to find attacking any cereal aphid, not just uh, Russian wheat aphid. We have done some exclusion cage studies. Uh, we did these first in the mid-90s. And at that time, uh, we were really unable to measure much uh, significant effect of biological control on Russian wheat aphid. But we repeated these studies uh, uh, around 2010 and in a much more, uh, uh, much more intensively, we looked at uh, exclusion effects uh, over uh, three years and three environments. So we have a much better idea of biological control activity currently. And it has become a much more important factor for us in terms of uh, Russian wheat aphid abundance. We often see reductions of uh, 70 or 80 percent. So it has become quite significant. We've also looked at uh, cultural practices uh, and we've, we've done a number of studies in this area. I think they all boil down to just a few uh, sort of key concepts. One of these is diversification of cropping. Uh, when aph the aphid came into Colorado, we were not a very diverse uh, cropping system, primarily uh, wheat fallow, so one crop in two years. And our typical system now is much more three crops in four years. Uh, volunteer management, I've mentioned, uh, that is a key issue in the southern plains and becomes less important as you go north. Uh, 
seeding dates. We generally recommend delayed seeding of fall grains and uh, early seeding of uh, spring grains. And then finally, the uh, general recommendation of uh, producing as diverse or as healthy a crop as possible. And that may seem sort of nebulous, but uh, really I have seen uh, many uh, healthy and vigorous crops just sort of grow through the aphid. I think uh, crop stress is a part, an important part of the aphid uh, picture. We've also looked at uh, plant resistance uh, over the years. Uh, this, uh, these two uh, plants are sister lines and the one on the right uh, lacks a gene uh, called DN4. And the, uh, they've been, uh, both plants have been uh, infested with equal numbers of aphids. The one on the right will sustain at least a 50% yield loss, and the one on the left will have negligible yield loss, if, uh, if at all. I'll skip that. Uh, we uh, did develop a number of varieties uh, based on this uh, DN4 resistance, and they were deployed over uh, a large part of uh, eastern Colorado, uh, arriving at the point of maybe being planted on 40 to 50 percent of the acres in the parts of the state with the most uh, consistent aphid problems. I'm going to skip that one. Uh, However, in uh, 2003, we started to get uh, reports of susceptible uh, reactions on our resistant varieties in the field. And after we eliminated the possibility of a mix-up in seed source, uh, the other possible explanation was a biotype. So uh, we uh, went down to where, we're, where these reports were uh, coming from collected aphids from the field, uh, brought them back to the greenhouse, and put those aphids and our greenhouse aphids on resistant plants. And this was uh, this was the uh, reaction, a susceptible reaction on a resistant plant with those field collected aphids and a uh, resistant reaction with the greenhouse aphids. And this is, uh, was the evidence that we used to uh, document that we had a biotype, which is a uh, subpopulation capable of overcoming uh, deployed resistance. Since then, we have uh, described uh, roughly eight biotypes. There are many more than these. Uh, uh, there are at least 50 or 60 in captivity at the moment. but. Uh, for us, the key uh, is really this uh, Russian wheat aphid 2. This, uh, this biotype is virulent to almost all of the resistant sources that we have. And it also has some um, biological traits that in the field that make it uh, more successful year-round than, uh, than the original biotype, which is Russian wheat aphid 1. Uh, the next thing I wanted to mention uh, is uh, yield loss. You know, th with any uh, uh, pest and plant interaction, it's going to be variable. But in, uh, in winter wheat, uh, mainly from uh, tillering through uh, boot stage, uh, I think it's a pretty good uh, number that uh, you get about a half percent yield loss per 1% infested stems. In other words, if you have a 100% infestation, you'll see a yield loss of about 50%. Uh, that number is not as well understood in barley, but we do know that it's quite a bit higher, probably uh, uh, eight-tenths of a percent or almost a 1% a per 1% uh, relationship. There are also quality losses. In uh, winter wheat, these would be... Uh, expressed primarily as reduced test weight. In barley, uh, in addition to reduced test weight, you will also see effects on malting quality. In our uh, control recommendations, again, this is winter wheat, uh, we focus on uh, the period between regrowth and the spring, which would be uh, 
roughly tillering uh, through early boot. And that's kind of the growth stages that we consider to be the most susceptible and the part of uh, crop development where we see the most uh, return on insecticide investment. We do have a, uh, a dynamic economic injury level that take, lets you take into account uh, uh, control costs and crop value. And there's also a uh, sequential, sam sequential sampling plan to go with that. Uh, and the final thing I wanted to uh, mention a little bit is uh, chemical control. We have uh, spent a lot of time over the years uh, testing a variety of, of insecticides. For me, a good control of Russian wheat aphid is if after three weeks you still have a 90% reduction in uh, aphid abundance, you've uh, gotten pretty good control out of your treatment. Uh, this uh, middle column here is the number of times that we've tested a particular treatment along with the uh, number of times that it reached that uh, level of good control. So uh, the takeaway from this table is that uh, chlorpyrifos uh, has been really our most uh, consistent treatment over the years. There are others, but uh, this is the most consistent and uh, this is the one that our, our growers rely on. That said, we do uh, uh, have a, a real need for a replacement for chlorpyrifos. Uh, chlorpyrifos itself uh, overall is on the regulatory chopping block, and that's of uh, major concern for uh, the wheat industry and others in the, in the U.S. But also uh, in barley, uh, chlorpyrifos has never been uh, uh, registered, so we've always needed something in uh, barley. And it looks for us, it looks like uh, that this uh, premix of lambda cyhalothrin and uh, thiamethoxam is going to be the replacement that we can rely on. A couple of other uh, comments about chemical control. One is uh, perimicarb. I know that's of great interest here, but uh, it has never been uh, labeled on wheat. So we've only tested it maybe once or twice, and that was uh, right at the beginning of the uh, incursion. Uh, because uh, I work primarily in winter wheat, we also have not spent a lot of time on seed treatments. Uh, with seed treatments in winter wheat, you would be expecting to uh, apply that insecticide in September and expect it to be uh, effective in May. And that's just not, not going to happen under, under our conditions. However, in spring grains, uh, we do use uh, neonicotinoid seed treatments quite a bit for sort of research purposes if we need an aphid-free control. Uh, and under those conditions, uh, the neonics have been really quite, quite effective. Uh, and I think, so uh, just a couple more slides. One is uh, where we are now. And that is, uh, I'd say for the most part, we now rely on uh, certain cultural practices. Uh, primarily those that I indicated earlier, uh, and naturally occurring biological control. If, uh, if those fail, then our growers uh, will scout and intervene with a chlorpyrifos treatment. When that occurs, there's generally just not enough time uh, for natural enemies to uh, do much with the aphid. So I don't think we're interfering with uh, future biological control efficacy with that approach. And then uh, finally, I just wanted to quickly point out why I don't work with Russian wheat aphid anymore. And that's uh, because of this uh, pest that we have recently started to deal with. This is a uh, wheat stem sawfly. This is undamaged wheat. And this is damaged wheat. This is an insect that bores into the stems of wheat, girdles the interior of the stem, and when you get a good wind, and usually just two or three weeks prior to harvest, it can blow the entire crop over. This is a, a devastating problem for us. And we've had to refocus most of our uh, 
wheat entomology and a good part of the wheat breeding program to address this particular issue. And I think with that, I will turn it over to the next speaker. Yeah, so I think Frank's done a, a really good job of overviewing, I guess, the biology of Russian wheat aphid and I guess how, I guess, the impacts have, have been realised in the US and also, I guess, how Russian wheat aphid are managed uh, in the USA. As I guess Craig mentioned, my role is just to provide a little bit of background and a bit of context about what we've seen thus far in Australia. And of course, we are very much at the beginnings of our understanding and learnings around this particular pest. Um, so I'll provide a little bit of uh, insight into what happened last year, what we saw, and I guess make some postulations about what we might be headed for in 2017. I guess before I start, I just wanted to acknowledge the co-authors on this paper, uh, Gary McDonald and Julie Severi from CESA, and uh, Greg Baker and Martin Van Helden from SARDI. So I guess a, a good place that uh, I thought we should start is essentially where we currently know Russian wheat aphid to be. Um, Craig alluded to this at, uh, in the introduction that uh, Russian wheat aphid are now uh, widely distributed across southeastern Australia. So, you know, they're quite prevalent uh, in South Australia, particularly the eastern part of South Australia. As many people in this room will know, they're, they're also now pretty abundant in the western part of the, the state, particularly the Wimmera and Mallee, um, and have also found their way up into southern New South Wales. Craig also mentioned, and I guess a little bit surprising um, to us, that we've already had the first detections as well in Tasmania, uh, which were confirmed earlier this year. At this stage, there's no known Russian wheat aphid or perhaps even suspected Russian wheat aphid in the states of WA or Queensland. Um, but already we've seen that this pest has the ability to move and spread pretty quickly. Um, so I guess, you know, uh, my suspicions are that we're going to see this pest continuing to expand into, say, into these other regions, particularly into northern New South Wales this year. I guess just looking a little bit more closer to home in terms of Victoria, um, as I mentioned, I guess, you know, we've seen last year, and again, many of you in the room will be aware of this, that we saw quite a lot of Russian wheat aphid moving across from South Australia into uh, Victoria, particularly the Mallee and, uh, and the Wimmera regions, but it's also been found in the southern part of the state in the Western District, Central Victoria, um, and as I said, also up into Southern New South Wales, particularly the Riverina. So I guess that's where it's currently known to be, but of course it's likely to be, and it's almost certain to be in other areas that we haven't quite yet uh, mapped. So look, Frank's already, I guess, given a bit of an overview of what Russian wheat aphid looks like um, and how you might be able to distinguish it from our current cereal aphids that we have in this part of the world, being, you know, I guess the primary guys, oat aphid and corn aphid. So I will actually go through this slide. Um, and I guess also Frank showed a few photos of some of the symptomatic plants, uh, both cereal and, uh, sorry, uh, both wheat and barley plants that we saw um, in the US. And I guess these are some photos taken uh, locally here last year in Victoria. And I guess I'll just point out that essentially the symptoms that we see overseas and in the US that Frank talked about very much hold true with what we see over here under Australian conditions and Australian varieties. So, you know, fairly symptomatic, fairly stark, uh, I guess, damaged symptoms. What I would though just point out uh, for those guys that haven't yet seen Russian wheat aphid and, and recognising that this year we will hopefully be vigilant and, and keeping an eye out for uh, this particular pest in cereal crops, I would just I guess point you in the direction of this back pocket guide. This is a guide that GRDC have developed and, and I guess updated last year to incorporate Russian wheat aphid. It's freely available, you can throw it onto your smartphone or your, your iPad. Um, as a good, useful guide to help you, I guess, gain confidence in identification of Russian wheat aphid in the field. Um, you know, we saw this last year, and I'm sure many of you uh, will appreciate this, that, you know, this year we're not just going to see Russian wheat aphid in, in our cereal crops. The other guys are still there. They're very abundant. They're very prevalent. And getting that identification right is going to be important so that we get the right, I guess, management uh, decisions being made. So I, I would certainly suggest you, you take a look at that. So in terms of you know, what we saw locally in, in, uh, in 2016, I guess the way I've kind of conceptualised it looking back at the year, I've kind of broken up the season into two parts. Um, the first part was, I guess, that autumn through to early winter period. Oh. So, you know, Craig, I think, mentioned this, that the first detections that we saw of Russian wheat aphid and the first, first confirmation uh, occurred in mid-May at a place called Tarley in South Australia. 
And what we saw with those early infestations and also um, infestations that happened in other parts of South Australia and perhaps even uh, in some of those uh, western parts of the state is that we tended to see an association with a few things. So we saw that there was an association with late herbiciding of volunteers and grasses. Uh, we saw earlier sowing crops tended to have the most Russian wheat aphid numbers and also we had Russian wheat aphids popping up in paddocks that didn't have an insecticide seed dressing. So there were certainly some associations that we saw um, in those uh, early months. What we saw also, and I guess is evident from the map that I showed earlier, is that we, we tended to see during this period uh, what we think was, was happening um, was that this uh, species was then spreading to new parts of the state and also, of course, across to Victoria. And I, I guess what we've seen is a bit of a, a, a trend with prevailing winds, which would make sense when, I guess, you think about aphid biology and how not just this aphid, but all aphids tend to move long distance, which is through getting up into wind currents. Of course, you know, and Craig uh, alluded to this, that there was insecticide spraying going out uh, for this pest last year in South Australia and parts of Victoria. Um, in many cases, that was warranted. There are two chemicals that we use primarily and two that are currently available under APVMA emergency use permits, and they are uh, clopyrifos and pyrimacarb. And both of those uh, in the field were, were proved to be pretty effective in controlling this pest. I guess then what we, we sort of saw as we got into the, the colder months of winter is that we started to see a slight reduction in the, I guess, the development of aphid populations. Um, and we, so, we sort of started to see a, a little bit of a slowdown in terms of where we were picking up new detections of, of this pest. So that all happened in the kind of autumn, early winter period. And then I guess we, we flipped over to the late winter uh, and into spring last year. So what did we see? We, we saw further detections which could indicate further spread or it may be that you know, the, the, the movement happened prior to this but we certainly saw new detections in this period including the first detections up in New South Wales which happened in about mid-August. Then I guess we were sort of gearing up for perhaps spring which was obviously a very much an unknown quantity for us and certainly based on you know, the US experience and other experiences um, around the world is a period, I guess, when we're most at risk of suffering uh, yield impacts from this pest. So, you know, I guess we were, we were kind of un, uncertain as to what spring would, would hold. Uh, I guess the good news is that what we saw quite broadly across southeastern Australia is we saw drastic reductions in Russian wheat aphid numbers coming out of winter and, and through that entire spring period. Um, and we think that there was a few major contributing factors for this. As you'll recall, you know, we had a fair amount of rainfall last year during this period um, and those unseasonal conditions really had a, an important role in causing these populations to crash out in the field. And again, we saw this very broadly across, I guess, where Russian wheat aphid are known to be. So rainfall had a big impact. It, it knocked probably aphids off plants and, and I guess also facilitated uh, fungal infections, which were also very prevalent last year. So, you know, Frank talked about uh, the importance of biological control in the US and where that fits now currently in dealing with Russian wheat aphid. Last year as well, we saw, you know, I guess quite, um, quite encouragingly that, that beneficial uh, uh, biological controls, fungal pathogens, including beneficial insects, really played a role in that period as well. We saw evidence uh, and widespread evidence of uh, aphid parasit uh, parasitism, um, but also a number of naturally occurring predators as well. Things like hoverflies, lady beetles, lacewings, these sorts of guys that we're all very familiar with um, that are known to attack aphids. We're transferring across very readily um, onto this new exotic species. So that was quite encouraging and certainly that combination of weather and biological controls um, really caused a, a great reduction in, in aphid, um, aphid numbers during that spring period, which is quite contrary to what we're expecting, which is I guess Russian wheat aphid numbers to increase in spring and, and cause us some headaches. I guess the other good news that we saw last year from, a, from an Australian context, and again this uh, is very much in line with what happens internationally, is that once those aphids were controlled, whether it be coming out of spring through rain and biological control, but also we saw it earlier in the season with uh, chemical control, is once the aphids were gone, those plants recovered remarkably well. Uh, and I think that's really a good sign that you know, once a plant uh, is infected with Russian wheat aphid, it doesn't mean that you know, it, it potentially is, should be dealt with like a virus infection. If the aphids are controlled, the, aph uh, the plants we saw uh, were recovering uh, pretty well. So I guess that, you know, that was 
you know, that's kind of, I guess, what I've talked about, that, you know, we, we had some really good stories coming out of last year that we didn't see this build-up in spring. And across the board, uh, there certainly was some yield losses, but it, it certainly wasn't uh, significant. So in terms of looking ahead, and I guess what we can learn from last year is, I guess, one thing that I've sort of put here is around some of the crop risk factors uh, that we saw in 2016. So I haven't talked about Greenbridge, um, but obviously Frank touched on the importance of Greenbridge. Um, and clearly we think last year also Greenbridge was important um, heading into the 2016. So um, some of you may recall that there were some uh, pretty heavy rainfall events in January and March, particularly in SA, but parts of Victoria as well, that promoted these volunteers. Um, and we think that that certainly had an important role to play in transferring Russian wheat aphids onto cereal crops. I've already mentioned the next three, that we also saw associations with paddocks that were late, uh, that had late herbiciding of volunteer cereals and grasses that were early sown and that didn't have insecticide seed treatment. So if you've got that combination, that certainly will elevate the risk of a particular paddock of having Russian wheat aphid infestation. And that's not unique to Russian wheat aphid. That will be the, the, the case for any uh, cereal aphid, those contributing factors. Um, what we also saw last year, and again, this is not unique just to Russian wheat aphid, was that we typically saw uh, within paddocks uh, highest numbers of aphids on stressed plants and parts of the paddock that were stressed. So uh, sandy rises where there was saw that was compacted. Um, also last year, of course, we had um, some water logging issues. Plants were stressed from, from water logging. They were often where you'd go into a paddock and find the greatest numbers of Russian wheat aphid and find symptomatic plants. And again, that's not unique to Russian wheat aphid. That's very typical uh, of all broadacre aphids. So I guess there's some of the crop risk factors that you might want to consider uh, moving forwards into 2017. So how is 2017 shaping up? So already, of course, uh, you're, you're very much aware, uh, better than I, that there is already a bit of a summer uh, green bridge occurring, particularly in some parts of the state. Um, that is going to obviously uh, elevate the, the risk for, for infections this year, um, but of course we're still a few months away from sowing, so uh, the, the rainfall events that may or may not occur between now and then will also be important. Um, we also know from scouting that's going on in South Australia and, and in Victoria that if you go out now, it's actually not that difficult to find Russian wheat aphid in those localities where they were found last year. So we know they're out there, they're persisting on you know, uh, summer grasses and, and volunteer cereals. Um, so we know that there's that background population out there in the environment. And of course, we also know that uh, these guys will continue to move and to spread into new areas. So, you know, if we, we weren't dealing with Russian wheat aphids last year, it doesn't mean that we won't be uh, this year. They'll undoubtedly continue to move uh, through probably that, that autumn period. So I guess I just wanted to finish with a few considerations uh, from my perspective. I haven't talked about seed dressings. Frank uh, touched on it very briefly. We have done a little bit of work already looking at insecticide seed dressings and Russian wheat aphid. Um, I guess the preliminary bit of work that we've done would indicate that our existing seed treatments uh, in cereals that are registered for other cereal aphids are going to be very effective in controlling this pest. So there's nothing really unique about this particular species that would indicate that those seed treatments aren't going to provide uh, good protection to emerging barley and emerging cereal crops. So I think that's you know, uh, an important uh, point. But of course, you know, we probably need a bit more work done in our context about the length of protection and so forth that we might expect. There's certainly been a little bit of discussion at previous events around uh, the merit or the, perhaps the, the plan to be also putting out chlorpyrifos at the time of herbiciding paddocks. Uh, I, for one, um, uh, question that approach, particularly if you're following that up with an insecticide seed dressing, but certainly happen, uh, very happy to have that conversation uh, if people would like. Obviously, I've touched on the Green Bridge, um, and Frank has also talked about how controlling the Green Bridge in the US is an important strategy for this pest. Um, again, of course, we'd like to see Green Bridge control done over larger areas than just individual paddocks, but that's not practical there is still absolutely benefit in cleaning up a green bridge within a paddock. It's not going to solve all the, uh, all the issues, but it's certainly going to help. Um, so things like cereal volunteers, but also, of course, there's a lot that we don't know about what the alternate host will be in Australia just yet, but based on what we know overseas, and also, I guess, a little bit of what we saw last year in terms of where we found Russian wheat aphid on some grasses, 
these are the types of, I guess, species you want to be uh, thinking about if, if considering or trying to understand where Russian wheat aphid might be. So particularly bromus, but also things like hordium, lolium, and phalaris and poa. Certainly I believe, and again, we've got a bit of evidence from, from international to say that we don't necessarily want to be just prophylactically using insecticides to control Russian wheat aphid. We certainly want to be backing any decisions around insecticide use with monitoring and I guess using the economic thresholds that were put out last year by GRDC as a bit of a guide as to when an insecticide might be economically uh, warranted. Of course, those thresholds are very much <laughs> taken from overseas. None of this work, of course, has been done in Australia. So they are just a guide. We do need local research to validate or perhaps revise those thresholds, but they're a good starting point. I think it's much more pertinent to be keeping those chemicals in our back pocket for spring when, you know, this year we're unlikely to have a season like last year. We're probably going to have uh, greater numbers of Russian wheat aphid in spring this year, one would suspect. Um, that's when we want to be protecting the flag leaf for grain fill and to be protecting yield. So that's to me where perhaps insecticides have a, a more important role to play. But of course, you know, we just need to be vigilant with our monitoring and, and making decisions on a case by case decision. And my final point, uh, Craig, would be, I guess, just to, to ram home the, the message that, you know, we do want to be considering natural enemies in terms of, you know, what role they may play in managing Russian wheat aphid. Um, and obviously that has bearings on insecticide selection and I guess the, the um, the decision in the first place to, to, uh, to put out an insecticide spray. So I just wanted to acknowledge the, the following people and organisations and I'll leave it there. Hi, as I mentioned, I'm based in Launceston, so uh, we were a little bit surprised to um, see Russian wheat aphid in Tasmania um, earlier this year, so we've joined the, joined the club. Um, we conducted, this is a quick overview of trials that we conducted in Victoria this uh, year to evaluate some insecticides for the control of Russian wheat aphid um, and some of the challenges that we had um, in, in doing that work. So an emergency um, permit was uh, submitted, well, um, enacted, I guess, for, for Clopyrifos and um, um, two sort of uh, quite old chemistry, but the um, but that's what we were playing with. Um, there were 16 trials conducted in Victoria and South Australia. There were um, seven in of those were conducted in Victoria. Um, so the, these are the the things that we're looking at: the comparison of single dose rates, uh, the comparison of the selected insecticides um, at two doses, the effective temperature at application, the effective um, spray volume and quality, um, and the influence of adjuvants. Um, this is a, a spread of the, the trials that were conducted. Um, in Victoria, they were in the Mallee and then down um, in the south in, uh, with, uh, with barley, you should say. So trials were conducted in wheat and barley. This is the uh, typical trial site. Um, they were uh, designed as ran well, random complete blocks um, of uh, 10 metres by 10 metres. Um, and you can see there that the, the, the numbers are the, the actual um, the treatments. Um, but you can see the colours that the, the spread, when you've got a trial that size, um, you know, it's basically 120 metres wide, um, it's difficult to get um, a, even spread and that was one of the big challenges that we had with finding sites uh, where we're looking at 10 aphids per tiller which was um, pretty hard to achieve um, but you can see the spread there you can see the hot spots in the red um, and but that was uh, you know considered a reasonable sp spread for the trial work but um, yeah it, it raised some problems for sure um, the, uh, there was one spray application made uh, at different, the, the trials were conducted over, um, from basically from chillering to early flowering, um, the, the range of uh, timings. The um, 25 chillers per plot were assessed and um, they were assessed at 7, 14 and 21 days. Um, 
So the challenges, I guess, for us uh, was the, the, um, the trials commenced fairly late in the season, particularly for wheat. Um, so the, the, we found that the later that the, um, we applied sprays, the um, less effective they were. Uh, the um, Russian wheat effort, as we've heard, uh, the leaves remained um, uh, rolled up. So when we're assessing them, you can't, it's not just a matter of counting the aphids, you've got to actually unroll the leaf to count them. So I think the first assessment we made was uh, um, on a, a trial the size of the previous slide, uh, was nearly six hours with two people assessing, one recording. So that was a, um, it, yeah, we, we got better at that and we got more people on board, but it was um, certainly um, wasn't much fun. Um, the growth stage is important um, at spraying, as I mentioned. The, we had much more success when the, uh, the plants were younger. The, um, the barley was sprayed um, at uh, basically chillering, and we got good control in barley, whereas with the wheat uh, at the later um, timings, it wasn't quite as successful. I think because the uh, the leaves were, were, were quite rolled and quite, um, it's quite difficult to get um, product through to them. Uh, we have the way above average rainfall and um, the, we found that the, the rain actually washed the aphids out of the plants, out, out of, from the plants, but it also the, um, para, there's a parasitic fungi that attacked the aphids and in some cases it just wiped out the whole trial. You know, we, could, we couldn't find a live aphid um, at the trial site, and it was before we sprayed, so it, um, it was a pretty effective control, but um, not appreciated in our trials. Um, so the, the, the other challenge was finding sites with a threshold of 10 um, aphids per tiller. That was, uh, that was, that was um, pretty difficult. It was more like you know, two or three. Um, so, and that decline in the natural population um, as the plants aged and also as uh, the, the rain affected it, the, the, sometimes we were, our results were skewed because the, um, um, there was a decline in the population. Um, the, the aphids also moved around the plant. They moved as the plants senesced, uh, the bottom leaves senesced, they moved up the plant and they actually moved into the heads as well. Um, uh, during the trials. So uh, single dose applications, um, they're the uh, fast act duo, the um, semi-alpha flex and the transform were uh, significantly less effective than the, um, than the other products. Um, Law span was the, the most effective and um, yeah, so you can see it's quite fairly clear results there. Um, and there's, the pressure was high at the site too, so you've got, you've got really good pressure, and this is in Bali, um, sprayed at um, tillering. Um, the comparison of the dose rates, uh, generally the higher dose rates uh, gave better results. Um, sometimes it, that wasn't significant, so there's certainly some evidence that the higher rates uh, work better. Um, again, that group in the middle um, haven't performed that well, but in other trials, um, those products actually work quite well in some of the trials in South, in South Australia. And they may have a, um, they may have a useful uh, role in um, perhaps uh, preventing aphids feeding and settling. So. Again, um, the difficult part was assessing these things, so 25 tillers per, uh, per site was... Uh, we got pretty good at unrolling leaves. There again, you can see a couple of parasitised aphids in that lot there. Um, spray volume and, and quality. Um, certainly, um, from this, these trials, it was obvious that the higher the, the, uh, the water volume or the spray volume, um, the better results. Whether that's a practical thing for broadacre, I'm not sure, but certainly the, um, 
the key message there is that you use the highest rates that you can. Um, the take home messages, um, rainfall significantly um, affects the population. Uh, so that's uh, something to keep in mind in those sort of conditions where they, um, that may be enough to actually control the um, Russian word aphid itself. Uh, Chlorpyrifos was the most effective. Um, Perimacarb um, was quite effective uh, um, and it also provides a, a softer option, I guess, and another a chemical group. Um, SP performance um, was a bit variable. Um, Lamba was, was probably the best of those. Um, the um, adjuvants, we did a couple of trials using adjuvants and had mixed results. Um, so we probably need to do a bit more work on that. And I'm, I'm sure it does. Um, there was evidence that it, that it improved the efficacy, but um, it, was, it was quite variable. Um, and spray application um, is pretty important um, to get that, uh, that water rate right and, um, and the timing on the plants that the early, if you can get, um, spray, if you spray those plants around that tillering period, it's more effective. And, and the plants actually grow out of those symptoms, so it's... Um, okay. Um, acknowledgements. Um, yeah, I certainly like to acknowledge all those people, um, including the growers and the um, the agronomists that helped us find sites because it was a uh, the Mallee's a massive area, and um, without them we would be still running around. I think so. Okay, thank you.